Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing and today we come to the final part of our major series about Chinese Kung Fu. In the past, say, 30 or so years, there has been a massive upsurge in interest worldwide in martial arts. Bruce Lee and his films are widely attributed with generating the initial interest. His legacy has been kept alive by actors such as Jet Li and Jackie Chan. In April, a movie starring these two martial arts legends called The Forbidden Kingdom went on international release. Not surprisingly, it was a huge success. Something else that was hardly a surprise was that it provoked a lively debate as to which of its two stars was the true king of martial arts. It's been an interesting debate, not least because in the Chinese cultural sense, a king of martial arts does not necessarily mean the best fighter. It's the man who best embodies the true martial spirit. Since the beginning of civilization, China has nurtured a unique national cultural tradition. The Chinese refer to it as martial arts, while Westerners call it Kung Fu. But whatever you call it, over the thousands of years in which Kung Fu developed, it moved on from its original role as a means of self-defense and physical training to form a cultural system. From then on, specific martial arts techniques were spread throughout society and passed down from generation to generation. Over the course of the centuries, the cultural aspect of martial arts developed slowly, free of outside influences. The martial arts have long been a common theme in literature. Stories that combined wild invention with precise detail turned the martial arts genre into an aspect of classical culture unique unto itself. Realistic and detailed descriptions of martial arts techniques first made an impact on popular culture through novels. Incredibly, the first martial arts novel in Chinese history, Yan Zidan, was written near the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty, around 1,800 years ago. The main protagonist of the story is Jing Ke, who is remembered in history as the man who nearly succeeded in assassinating Emperor Qin Shi Huang, China's first emperor. Yan Zetan is based on historical details gleaned from records of the historian and intrigues of the warring states. But in the novel, elements of legend and myth are added to enliven a vivid portrait of mercenaries during the warring states period. Yan Zetan included lifelike portraits of these mercenaries and was the first work to introduce this type of character to mainstream culture. A thousand years after the appearance of Yan Zidan, the greatest martial arts novel of Chinese feudal society made its appearance. That work is The Water Margin, written by Shu Nian, early in the Ming Dynasty. Like the novels about mercenary warriors that preceded it, The Water Margin included detailed descriptions of the martial arts techniques of the various schools of martial arts. These descriptions were based on the techniques practiced by actual martial arts masters, and they even provided material that martial arts practitioners could use in their search to find the founders of their schools. Shukudai 
，几乎所有的方方面面，他所使用的材料，在我这样一个长时期从事《水浒传》研究的人来看，我觉得非常逼真，非常真实，很多东西都有它原本的历史根据。Martial arts novels are still being written today, but so far, no one has been able to surpass the excellence of the Water Margin. In the 500 years since its publication. People have discovered that the key word to survival as a writer of martial arts novels and to win new fans is change. Biang Yu Shang's "A Dragon and Tiger Fight in the Capital" was the first book in which martial arts skills appeared in the form of a romantic fantasy, and in which martial arts warriors were depicted as idealized heroes. However, Liang is not the person who has most influenced contemporary martial arts novels. In 1955, six years after the founding of the People's Republic, the martial arts novel *Book and Sword: Gratitude and Revenge* was published in the Hong Kong newspaper *New Evening Post*, and it quickly attracted considerable attention. This was the first martial arts novel written by Louis Cha, who wrote under the pen name Jin Yong. Jean's last martial arts novel, *The Deer and the Cauldron*, was published in September 1972. But at that time, Jean announced he was putting down his pen, and true to his word, he never wrote another novel. Over a period of 20 years, in addition to writing one short story, Louis Cha completed 14 martial arts novels. The first Chinese characters of these 14 novels combined to form the following meaning. Shooting at white deer in a snowy day, writing about chivalrous men and a smile with blue mandarin ducks. Today, it is impossible to calculate how many copies of Jean's novels have been printed in China. Nearly every literature publishing house in the country, large and small, has published at least one of his books. Even though Jean started writing martial arts novels after Liang, he is considered to be the modern master of the form. In the 1800 years they have been around, martial arts novels have done a lot to generate enthusiasm for martial arts and promote the spirit of chivalry. However, the 20th century saw the influence of these novels eclipsed by a brand new form of mass media, the movies. In 1928, the Shanghai Mingxing Film Company made what was, for some time, widely believed to be China's first martial arts film: Destruction of the Red Lotus Temple. However, in point of fact, ten years earlier, the commercial press had made the short film The Thief, and the Anhui Film Company made a number of martial arts movies, including A Home Truth. However, Destruction of Red Lotus Temple was the most mature martial arts film of the period, and it became the standard. The directors of later martial arts films sought to emulate. At the same time, martial arts increasingly came to the attention of the Chinese public, and the influence of martial arts expanded. In the 38 years from 1912 to 1949, during which China was a republic, the country was constantly rocked by the separatism of the warlord period, political turbulence, clashes of ideologies. And the controversy over the use of indigenous and foreign methods, and all this resulted in conflicting impacts on the development of Chinese martial arts. In general, martial arts, which reached a low point after the Boxer War of 1900, gradually gained vitality during the Republic period. Countless martial arts associations, such as the Qingwu Athletic Association, the Beijing Sports Research Association, and the China Martial Arts Society, sprang up all over China. And there were more than 100 such associations in the three cities of Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin alone. In the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese people promoted the Chinese people. So, only the Chinese martial arts part of the Chinese martial arts can promote the Chinese people. Because it has many things. 锻炼身体又能够提高格斗技能，所以在那个时候，这个呃极贫之极弱的一个国度里头，那么通过武术来强国强种，那么在这种呼声下，凡是有爱国之心的人都会受到感染，都认为是一种鼓舞，所以练普及起来。
When the People's Republic was established in 1949, martial arts were designated a national treasure and the quintessence of Chinese culture. With this, they entered a new stage of development as the country pursued national construction. Under the guidance of Marshal Herlong's policy to develop, rectify, raise and disseminate, martial arts were designated for dissemination. Later, Zhu Du and Liu Xiaoqi both strongly supported the development of martial arts. In 1957, the State Physical, Culture and Sports Commission included martial arts in the list of competitive sports. It published simplified Tai Chi Chuan as well as materials on long boxing and martial arts involving the use of equipment. Jiang 毛泽东同志提出来的发展体育运动增强人民体质这个讲话太极圈，就运动量而言，就难易程度而言，它确实是那么普及起来很方便。Unfortunately, the widespread enthusiasm for martial arts didn't last very long. In the 1960s and 70s, especially during the Cultural Revolution, the growth of martial arts clubs came to a sudden halt. Interest in martial arts novels waned, and many schools of martial arts disappeared. The ideals that martial arts represented no longer had any influence in society. However, the situation in Hong Kong at this time was very different. In 1971, a young man by the name of Bruce Lee burst onto the scene in the movie The Big Boss. Having spent time in the US, Bruce Lee was familiar with American filmmaking techniques, and he used a kung fu style that was far more cinematic than any other Hong Kong performer of the time. In addition, he had a stunning body and the first-class command of martial arts techniques. On the set of The Big Boss, the director complained that he could perform martial arts moves so fast that it was hard to get them on film. In fact, everyone who worked with him the first time around aired this complaint. After the big boss broke attendance records in every Southeast Asian country, Bruce Lee quickly went on to conquer the world. And through his influence, the term Kung Fu became a part of the English language. Bruce Lee single-handedly launched a second wave of enthusiasm for martial arts movies. On top of this, while abroad, he opened the Martial Arts Academy and was instrumental in spreading both martial arts and enthusiasm for martial arts movies outside of Asia. From we 
和西洋。经过大量试验，被证明是非常有效的一些现代的运动项目结合起来，李小龙完成了一次非常了不起的武术的竞技运动的交流和组合工作。他有把中国武术通过影视手段来进行表达，不但充分的表达了武术运动技术，也充分的表达了中国人通过武来对自己进行内心世界的修养。追求高尚的品德等等这样一些理念，他都把它表达出来了。所以，尽管他拍的电影并不多，但印象是非常深的。当然，因为他走得很很早，他还有一些部分没有来得及更完善，或者没有来得及把他的体系啊更完备，于是乎给我们留下了无尽的遗憾。On July the 20th, 1973, Bruce Lee died at the age of 32 after having made only four and a half movies. But in that short time, he made an enormous contribution to Chinese martial arts and martial arts movies. His work introduced the world to Chinese kung fu. Bruce Lee ascended to the pantheon of kung fu gods. He left the world bereft of kung fu heroes. Western and Hong Kong movie companies began scouring Asia in search of the second coming of Bruce Lee, and it was just at this time that Jackie Chan appeared on the scene. Jackie Chan's performance in the movie *Drunken Master* made him an overnight sensation, and people flocked to theaters to watch his martial arts comedies. After *Drunken Master*, Jackie Chan made *Plan A*, *Police Story*, and a number of other movies that are still considered classics. Drunken Master 2, released in 1994, not only received great reviews; it was named one of the year's top 10 movies by Time magazine. Jackie Chan followed that movie with Rumble in the Bronx, and it too did brisk business at the box office, proving that Jackie Chan movies were both well received by critics and commercially successful at the same time worldwide. The popularity of martial arts movies in Hong Kong encouraged a number of movie companies to turn their eyes to the potentially enormous market to the north. Well, it just so happened that at around the same time, the Chinese government was becoming very interested in the development of martial arts. One day in 1978, Deng Xiaoping, who was then vice premier of the State Council, hosted a lavish luncheon banquet for a number of Japanese guests. During the banquet, the head of the Japanese delegation told Deng that he was learning Tai Chi Chuan. Whereupon Deng showed him some Tai Chi Chuan moves. A few days later, Deng was sent a piece of calligraphy extolling Tai Chi Chuan. This simple gift of calligraphy breathed new life into Chinese martial arts at a time just after the Cultural Revolution, when martial arts had been unjustly suppressed. Now, Cheng Zhu, who was then vice chairman of the National People's Congress, was also at the banquet. The next year, he met with representatives of the Hong Kong film industry in Guangzhou and suggested to them that they jointly make the movie Shaolin Temple. The movie Shaolin Temple was the first kung fu movie produced by Hong Kong and the mainland in cooperation. The film was financed by Hong Kong, and most of the actors were from the mainland. And the movie was shot. And mainland locations, but no one could have anticipated that this unprecedented experiment would produce a movie of such historic significance. Oh, 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 oh,
As soon as Shaolin Temple hit the theatres, it made a huge impact that reverberated throughout the world of film. The movie was shown in more than 100 countries and territories, and more than 500 million tickets were sold in China alone. At the time, movie tickets in China cost just one-tenth of the yuan, yet the movie still managed to earn 100 million yuan worldwide, smashing box office records previously set by Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. All the main actors in the film were national champions in one or more kinds of martial arts, and all the fight scenes were performed by the actors themselves. There were no stunt doubles. Moreover, all the action was real. There were no wires or springs. This was one of the reasons the film was so successful. Jet Li's first film made him an overnight sensation and everything went smoothly for him from the start. He made Kids from Shaolin, Once Upon a Time in China and Twin Warriors in Succession and followed up these hits with a good number of others. Jet Li has already become the third global kung fu megastar, following in the footsteps of Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. Since the 1980s, the popularity of traditional martial arts, competitive martial arts and kung fu novels and movies has grown rapidly, and these areas of interest have influenced and stimulated each other. Many A-list directors in China and abroad have made kung fu movies in recent years. These movies include Hero, House of Flying Daggers and Seven Swords, and all of them have ignited worldwide interest in Chinese kung fu. In 2000, Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon won four Oscars. Best Foreign Language Picture, Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, and Best Original Score. In 2007, USA Today selected it as one of the top 25 movies that changed Hollywood. Kung Fu movies have become highly important in the Chinese film industry's efforts to penetrate the global market. The movies have become indisputable cultural ambassadors in the process of drawing upon, carrying forward and popularizing China's martial arts culture. Under the influence of China's martial arts movies, the number of martial arts enthusiasts as well as the number of martial arts schools all over the world has risen sharply. Martial arts schools abroad have already become an important channel for popularizing China's martial arts and traditional culture, and many foreigners now come to China to study martial arts from masters. Martial arts took root in China's broad and deep culture. Its rich cultural content and distinctive national flavor make it an important component of China's outstanding national heritage, as well as a bridge of friendship to other cultures. In the future, Chinese martial arts with their long and glorious history will play an even greater role in making the world more familiar with China's outstanding national culture. Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan and Jet Li. It's thanks to these great movie stars that people around the world have been able to appreciate and in some cases take up Chinese martial arts.
As a jewel of traditional Chinese culture, Chinese Kung Fu today occupies a unique position as a bridge between cultures and between tradition and modernity. Based on its global appeal, there can be little doubt that in the future, Kung Fu will have an even bigger role to play in teaching the world to appreciate China's traditional culture. And with that, we come to the end of our major series about Chinese Kung Fu. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Qi Xiangjun from CCTV International. Goodbye.